Hello and welcome to Digital Stratosphere, the podcast that provides independent and technology agnostic advice to help organizations through their digital transformation journeys. This show will help you dial in on what it takes to drive a successful digital transformation from the high level strategies to the detail oriented practices that you may not have otherwise known. You will learn about the best practices and premier strategies used by industry leaders who have driven millions of dollars in net positive business transformations. In the next 20 minutes, we'll cover everything you need to know to make your digital transformation successful. My name is Sarah Djokovic and I'm your host and thank you so much for joining us today. In today's episode, we are going to cover the topic of customization. Joining me for today's discussion is Adam Cheatham, Director of Strategy and Transformation at Third Stage Consulting Group, which is an independent and technology agnostic digital transformation consulting firm. Adam and his colleagues have worked with some of the world's leading organizations in their transformation journeys, and he has provided support and guidance through defining strategies for transformation success. Adam, thank you for joining us on the show today. Thank you for having me. Of course, always so fun to have you back. So let's get into it, shall we? So each company has unique needs and processes, making customizations an attractive element to any ERP implementation. And what types of companies benefit most from customizing their ERP system? Yes. So when we're talking about customization of software, um, the ones that benefit the most are going to be the ones that have the greatest need for something different. Mm -hmm. Uh, When you have a a specific kind of requirement that makes you who you are or a specific need in the marketplace that you're addressing, sometimes maybe you're a bit disruptive to to the types of models that are out there. Those are the spaces that usually end up with the the most need and benefit for customization, as opposed to just the type of be- the customization that comes from just not wanting to adopt new processes. Okay, got it. Now there is a big difference between customizing an on-premise ERP system versus customizing a cloud ERP system. Can can you speak to the difference in customization strategies and really the level of effort and resources that go into customizing an ERP system based on its type, whether it's cloud or on-premise? Yes, so um, for the most part, um, on-premise ERP is a bit easier to to customize. The the reason for that is because you're buying one license per user and you, you own them in perpetuity, which means that you buy a license you buy a bunch of servers, you install your ERP on those servers and your licenses are based on that installation. You have greater access to that code um, and and your customizations don't impact anybody but you. Um, So what ends up happening is you have a lot more flexibility in writing different custom code. Um, In in many cases that might involve access to the actual source code of the ERP if you're given access to that. Um, whereas in a cl- cloud environment, because you have, you're talking more of a multi-tenant space where technically everybody's on the same ERP system, there are just a bunch of walls built to keep everything separate, um, the customization impacts don't just impact you. Um, so when the software is changed, it, in, it impacts everybody who is on that software. Um, so those changes then become available to everybody. What that means is that the software provider controls that code a bit more closely and and takes it um, and provides the advantage of having that one single updated platform so that you are staying up to date on your system uh, as, as you pay your subscription services as opposed to having to run individual updates and, and actively run updates to a system that's on an on-premise uh, server. Got it, yeah, that makes total sense. And it sounds like the flexibility of um, a cloud-based system is quite limited to what the ERP vendor has coded into their platform. And um, clients and users can't necessarily fine-tune the system itself to fit their company's unique needs. Now, that, if, that, yeah. That yeah, yeah, absolutely. And if that, that's the case, the, the primary customization opportunity left is the integration point between, for example, a CRM, the cloud 
ERP. So speak to us a little more about the integration points. So what are the limitations to customizing just the integration points versus having access to customizing the ERP platform as a whole and the integration points like you do in an on-premise solution? Yeah, so um, you, you essentially, in a, in a cloud environment, when you're talking about an integration, uh, mm -hmm. you, you have uh, more control over what that integration looks like in some cases because you, you very likely have more control over the actual system that you're integrating into it. Um, in a lot of cases, for example, you may buy an ERP, but you may have an existing legacy CRM that you want to bring into the, uh, the conversation as well, or you may buy a different CRM. So the integration point in the, the passing of data between one and the other um, is, is a point that requires a bit of massaging because each system, unless they are the same system, where let's say, for example, you buy a cloud system that has a CRM add-on of its own, um, if, you're, if they're different, um, the, the language that they speak effectively is different. The data structure can be very different and making sure that that data gets pushed from one to the other um, and then back the other direction translated appropriately is, um, is where you end up with the most flexibility for uh, tweaking and, and customizing some of the code as, as opposed to the changing of functionality in the cloud space. Um, in an on-premise solution, uh, there, there's quite a bit more uh, availability of um, options to leverage because you, it, the point that you're integrating with is on your system. So you could actually change your ERP system to accept the language that your CRM speaks a little bit more readily. That doesn't mean that that passing of data and that integration point doesn't need attention as well, but it does give you a bit more flexibility on being able to choose which point you want to modify. Awesome. So say a company integrates a cloud ERP software and they want to create some customizations within their integration points. What um, maintenance do they need to be able to keep up with when integrating customizations with someone else's ERP code? Yeah, so if, um, essentially the biggest point is when their ERP, that cloud ERP updates, um, you're going to want to be checking your integration points, right? So if they move a point and um, they shift it just a little bit, redefine it just a little bit, um, even if it's something as simple as um, that uh, a field that maps from one to the other um, used to be 10 characters and now it's going to allow 12, um, that just the sheer fact that it does, the, the integration point that you have before that's sending 10, from, uh, 10 characters from one field through an integration to 10 characters in another field, um, with that new field now accepting 12, you have two empty characters that that system is expecting to exist. And knowing what your integration should say with these 10 characters becoming 12 is, is an important part of how it is you'd want to keep your integrations up to date. So in a cloud space, your integrations are, need to be a bit more actively managed and actively kept up with, whereas in, um, in an on-premise space, your integrations can be a bit more static and you have a bit more control over when you upgrade your system, which means that if I'm going to upgrade my ERP, I, are, I know when I need to upgrade my integrations and I know what it is I need to do to test that as opposed to um, having to work more closely with the ERP provider on what it is is going to be deployed next and how it is your integrations need to be um, brought up to speed to handle that. Okay, got it. It's, it sounds like the, the cloud-based systems are flexible on the surface when looking at access and ease of integration, but it gets much more stiff when looking at a, a white glove approach there. When we come back from a quick break, I'm going to ask Adam some more questions about what to be aware of when trying to customize a cloud ERP solution. So we'll be right back with more of the Digital Stratosphere podcast. Welcome back to the Digital Stratosphere podcast. I'm Sarah Dogovic speaking with Adam Cheatham from Third Stage Consulting about global transformation strategy. 
So Adam, I wanted to go back to what we were just discussing. So before the break, you touched on the constant updates needed to maintain a customized integration point. So every time the cloud ERP vendor updates their platform, the integration point needs to also be updated as well. And in a recent YouTube video you put out about this topic, you discussed integration platform as a service. So what is that? Yes, so integration platform as a service, um, often abbreviated IPAAS, um, is very similar to software as a service, abbreviated SAAS, SAS. Um, it's, they're very similar, except that this is not software, it's an integration point, and you pay a subscription fee for it. What that means is, um, is let's say you have uh, two cloud systems. Um, let's say they are NetSuite and Shopify. Um, NetSuite doesn't take Shopify's data the way that it uh, that Shopify gives that data, so an integration is required. Um, there is a, uh, an example of this in the in the marketplace is Celigo, who is an integration platform as a service. They build an in integration and sell an integration between NetSuite and Shopify, and you pay a monthly subscription for that, the same way you pay for NetSuite monthly and you pay for um, Shopify monthly. What that means for you is that it's a, it is a set it and forget it type of thing where, you know, it's as Shopify changes uh, and is updated, Soligo is responsible for managing your integration so you don't have to constantly keep up. And when NetSuite is, is updated and, um, and upgraded, the, the same is true. Soligo is responsible for continuing to keep that integration intact. Um, it does get quite expensive, but um, there, there are some, some pros and cons to that. Yeah, so I wanted to ask next, what, what are the pros and cons of hiring um, a third party to manage integration points? Um, so some of the pros really are that, that set it and forget it approach, right? Where um, you know, in that, that same example, Soligo is going to handle that integration for you uh, for as long as you pay them, um, which gets to the cons part of it. It can get rather expensive. Um, and a recent, um, a recent client of mine uh, found that as they were working to find their Soligo integration and, and, and bring that on board, they, uh, Soligo had determined that in this um, e-commerce based economy that they were in quite high demand and their rates went up rather significantly. Um, and uh, they were nearly, until we, we conducted some of the negotiations for that client, they were nearly as expensive as the actual ERP system itself. Um, so that the, the cost can be rather significant, but the, the benefit of being able to set it and forget it and stay always up to date and have your integration between the two systems that are that are covered by that integration platform um, is certainly a benefit there as well because you don't have to do that in-house. Yeah. So as far as like the cloud ERP systems, they just want to push out the updates to the whole database of users no matter what their client base is. So knowing that, like what, what impact does that have on a company's software selection process in the initial stages of a digital transformation? Yeah, that's a, that's a fantastic question because um, at the end of the day, you have to know whether or not you fit into those standard spaces and to what degree. Um, you know, cloud software will force you to use their processes fairly aggressively and, and pretty tightly. Um, Whereas an on-premise based solution or an open source based solution um, even would allow you a lot more flexibility. Um, it, at the end of the day, the impact on your selection process should be that you, you should know where it is you need to be different. Um, and if there is nowhere that you need to be different, then that's great. You, you know, the cloud's gonna fit, uh, fit you fairly well. You just need to find the, the cloud system that fits you closest. Um, from a perspective of if you do need to be different, um, you may consider additional uh, more advanced modules or, um, or uh, other third party products. Say, for example, if you are in, um, have some, some highly advanced warehousing and distributions, you might consider a software like HighJump to integrate with your cloud, which offers both on premise and cloud based solutions. So, uh, depending on where it is you guys land as a client to be um, either a, a, a very standard, more general company or a very unique company will, 
will have an impact on that selection process. Um, and then your selection process in that regard should also include how does you plan to support this cloud system? Um, you know, internet speeds are, are a fact of life these days. Um, if you don't have the infrastructure to support all the data that's going to be going through those pipes, um, you'll consider uh, what it is that means for um, your monthly services with regard to your service providers. Um, and whereas if you're looking at more of an on-premise based solution, you're, you're likely to have to have a team that is required to support that software and um, and maintain it along the way so that as you are conducting updates on your own, um, that uh, something that's covered. Yeah, definitely. And kind of wanted to piggyback and see maybe if you have anything else to add to it, because typically, like you were saying, like software systems, um, companies look for software systems that fit their unique business models um, and needs. And it sounds like it's not as simple when you're contemplating the cloud ERP system, because it's just more just what you what you see is what you get. So um, I think you touched on it a little bit, but if you want to add anything, in what situations does it make sense for a company to try fit into a software rather than have the software fit into their company? Yeah, uh, as early in your digital transformation as possible, you want to know what your priorities are and what your strategic advantages are in the marketplace um, and, and what your competitive advantages become and how you identify them should have an impact on which software systems you're willing to, to, to take on. And if you're talking about a software system that is um, not going to allow you to maintain the way you run your strategic advantages and the way that you sustain your competitive advantage, that software system is likely to have a dramatic impact on your ability to do business because it will change the way you approach the marketplace in a way that may diminish the, the value that you add. Um, so that's that's really where I would start to focus on uh, trying to see where a software doesn't fit. And in the other spaces where you ask questions like, so why do we do that that way? It's just because it's, it's always been done that way. Mm-hmm. Uh, you you want to think a little bit more directly about what that means to you and what the cha- change impact is there to do with the way the software does it. Because if it's not part of your competitive advantage, it doesn't necessarily, it shouldn't matter how you do it and getting into a best practice and, and onto a cloud system may drive some significant efficiencies for you that will likely lead to some of the benefits that you're looking for. Um, you do need to make sure that in that case, your business process management and your change management are managed effectively um, because you're going to be asking people to do things the way that the software does it and they aren't going to have a lot of options. And so managing that change and making sure that your adoption is um, is appropriately accounted for is important as well. Awesome. Thanks for that. And in your experience, have you seen customizations ever hurt a digital transformation project rather than actually help it? Yeah, so customizations actually can really dramatically hurt a digital transformation project. Um, and the reason for that is because they are expensive. Uh, you, know, the, you know, people talk about cloud being expensive, but customizations are expensive too. And there's a lot of hidden costs within that where if I customize a software, it makes it very difficult to stay updated. And every time I update, I more or less need to uh, reconfigure and recustomize my software to maintain those custom points. Um, at some point, that means that you're going to... Uh, Every software uh, system that's customized gets to the point where it's over customized and can't be updated. At that point, um, your digital transformation is then pretty significantly hampered by the fact that you can't continue to transform. Your software becomes a static thing and um, moving to the next version becomes prohibitively expensive and, and a risk to the business because those custom processes that you created in the code um, are now going to need to be changed and all the places that they touch and all the hooks that they have somewhere else are also going to need to be tested and possibly changed and the, uh, the ball of yarn gets pretty quick, pretty, pretty big, pretty quick. Dang, yeah, that's, that's a lot to think about when kind of considering <laughs> which route you want to go in the end and obviously like what's going to work best for, for you and you know the overall vision. And yeah, this has been super informative. So thanks so much for sharing those insights. And of yeah, of course, thank you. And if our listeners want to learn more, what, what are some resources that you might suggest for them? Yes, so um, you know, we have a, a great YouTube 
channel that I would suggest you guys look into um, if, if you're looking for more. Um, otherwise, if you if you have specific questions, feel free to reach out to me either through email or through LinkedIn. Subscribe to our our, our LinkedIn and YouTube channels, um, and hopefully we'll have a chance to chat about these things in greater detail. Awesome, thank you. And we're about out of time, but I wanted to thank you so much for being here today and for sharing all this awesome knowledge. Of course, thank you for having me. Of course. And thank you guys all for listening. Again, my name is Sarah Dokovic, and we'll see you next time on our next episode of the Digital Stratosphere podcast.